Adil Buhariwala, thank you so much for joining us today. And I wanted to begin by asking you a question. What's in your mind would be the top three um, takeaways that you want participants to remember from your session today? Okay. First of all, thank you. Thank you for inviting me for this. And thanks to G31000 that I'm a lot wiser about risk management today. Uh, as regards my presentation, the key messages that I'd like to pass on to people who would be using ISO 31000 is, A, firstly, before you do anything, get complete total knowledge of ISO 31000. Get a good understanding of it. And one of the ways you can do it is to do the certified ISO 31000 examination. Because in between the lines, there's actually a lot of meaning, a lot of deep ideas hidden in the standard. Absolutely. Absolutely. And trust me, why I say do this exam, because that really tests whether you know the nuances that are there in the, uh, in the text of the framework, the principles, and the processes. So the first one is complete and total understanding. Secondly, look at your organization and if you feel that you can start this initiative by first getting your top management buy-in, go for that first. But don't be held back because of that. You could try it another way by you know, demonstrating proof of concept in, in some way and then going for it. Because you know, a lot of top executives say, hey, all this sounds good in theory. You know, I don't know whether I, I should go for this until I see some exam. So do that. But keep the, uh, the framework in mind and the principles in mind. And thirdly, if you want to truly appreciate ISO 31000, clear your mind of traditional risk management knowledge that you may have prior to that. Mm. Because that will impede you from getting its full flavor. Mm. And how did you, you being in the internal audit role for most of your career, how, did you ever have a, like an internal challenge uh, having on one shoulder these sort of internal audits, uh, you know, little, little voice saying we should find you know, non-compliances and gaps and uh, you know, see if we can fix the processes. And uh, on the other shoulder, you get it to know risk management, you, you had this voice, risk management voice, which said, I actually shouldn't punish people, I should work with them trying to prevent stuff before it happens. They basically need to help them prevent something for the auditor later to find. Which, which of those voices was stronger in your mind? You know, actually, I didn't have too much of a conflict in this area, and I'll tell you why. I was one of the 16 people on the International Committee of the Institute of Internal Auditors when they were rewriting the standards for the professional practice of internal auditing. And I was one of the, in fact, I was the vice chairman at one time. And one of the key changes that were made was this thing about internal audit being perceived as a value-adding function. Mm -hmm. Businesses make decisions with money in mind. You know, the end result is the return. What return am I getting from my investment in internal audit? And if it's negative, negative, negative all the time, that does not work. So my mindset already had that for many years. I would say around 2000, 2001 or so. So it did not pose that much of a challenge to me. Mm -hmm. Also, the philosophy that we had adopted, thanks to my then boss, was we are not here just to find faults. If you're doing something well, and we think that the best way to manage risk is to do more of it, we'll give you a pat on the back. So, yes, compliance is there, and if you don't comply with, by, by you know, hitting you on the head with a stick, it's not going to make you comply. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing about punishing a kid. As soon as the parents are not looking, the kid will do it. So if you praise it, if you make that person feel, hey, this is in your interest, mm -hmm. and I'm just assisting you, they'll do it. And that's the, the methodology we use. 
And when you combine sort of the risk management and the internal audit, how, how did it work? How, how did risk management influence the way you approach internal audit planning, internal audit uh, delivery, reporting? How, how did that work? You see, from about 20 years ago, when the the way we did internal audit was, okay, which are the areas we need to audit? There's finance, there's HR, there's IT, there's procurement. In finance, there is a payments function, receive. So let's do that. And by the way, payments is critical, so we have to do that every year. Mm -hmm. Without, you know, saying maybe payments is not that critical because now there are controls. No doubt that's where the company's money is going up. But there is something else that you're not looking. So we said we need to get to think like the CEO. What keeps the CEO awake at night? That's what we should be addressing. And then you say it's the uncertainty, it's business risk. Mm -hmm. So that's where you need to get. And that's how that relationship came. And we were very clear, as I put up that fan in my presentation, what we as internal auditors can do, should do, and what we should not. So we would keep away from that, but where we found it was not there, we would encourage, create awareness to get it done. So without doing a line management, risk management function, we still use that effectively to plan our audits. And, and based on what you're saying now and what you said in the presentation, I hear that internal audit department played quite a significant, a very important role in raising awareness. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is a very, very critical, when you say value adding, you ask an auditor, many auditors will say, you know, trying to increase their bottom line, their revenue. That's hard, hard evidence. But what's the softer aspect of value adding? And it's this changing the mindset. Yeah, exactly. That's the soft issue. And sort of continuing on the soft issue side, um, find a young person moving into risk and audit space or a, a person from finance trying to transition into that space, what would you recommend? What would your advice be to a, a person coming to, into the risk and audit space? Into the risk in this? A, that remember when you were doing a line function, you were a risk owner. Okay? So now, when you are moving into it, you might be moving there, obviously, from, let's say, career growth and so forth. And you'll be actually now become, you know, making active decisions. You may have been a risk owner who was not making decisions, but yet, you know, playing a key role. You might be now getting into it. So tell yourself that you're just going to be doing a more critical job of what you were doing. It's not a change. Every person who works in the organization is managing risk in one way or the other, Absolutely. including the janitor. You may, he may not have the manager's designation, yeah. but he is or she is managing it. So every function that you are doing, you are managing risk. Uh, of course. And what advice would you give a young person coming from a university, like just stepping into the audit and risk? That risk analysis is, I think, going to be the profession of the future, which will include all the aspects of risk management, risk assessment. Analysis is one aspect, but that's going to be the critical aspect. Mm -hmm. And companies are going to look for more people like that. And that's the future. So train yourself. Don't just go in with basic knowledge. Train yourself, invest in yourself, and go for it. Excellent. Thank you. It's a good note to, to finish on. Thank, Thank you so very much. much Pleasure. Thank you.